So I think I misunderstood the assignment. I didn't know there'd be people here. This was one of those Zoom call situations. So this is uncomfortable for me. So this ought to be, this ought to be great. And I'm in a little tech cage. This will also be great. Somewhere on the screen will be my x-rays, I'm assuming. People can check, see if I have any broken bones. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew McKenzie. I am the app dev team manager at NCI. Perhaps was, given this misunderstanding. It's not exactly proper attire for an event like this. But we're just going to push through. I committed, and there's no turning back. So, all right. Welcome to Envision 2021. It's so good to have people back here. Uh, a little bit different for those who attended last year. I was the giant face. I put the green background, which also then matched the background that was on the rest of the screen, so I looked like a floating head. I am indeed real in the flesh. Here I am. And I will be the MC for the afternoon. MC is okay. I thought maybe tour guide would be appropriate. That had a bit of a Willy Wonka feel. Apparently, Oompa Loompas were not available for today, nor do I want anyone's kids turning into blueberries. So I decided to go with host which means at any time I might call someone on stage and I might just give away prizes by the end of the day. As we go through, through the day, just quick recap of kind of how things are going to work. The main hall here is gonna be open throughout the day. So breakout rooms, I believe are uh, out this way here. I gotta keep turning in circles. I'm not used to this 360 thing. So breakout rooms over here, you'll have a bunch of sessions there. We have three tracks, the, the business track, technical track, and the cybersecurity track. So the, feel free to hop out to those of the appropriate sessions when the, uh, when the time comes. Hop into this room any point throughout the day, talk to our vendors, our sponsors, the folks that help make Envision happen. That would be good. I know the other thing, I'm trying to get through my list of updates. Internet, apparently that's important. The only thing holding back the world from falling into a zombie apocalypse. If you need the access code, I'm told it is F-A-R-N-D. For the detectives out there, you can probably assume what that's for, but F-A-R-N-D, all lowercase, is the access code for the internet. Okay, I think those are my bulleted items, and they're great. Uh, to get things started, I'm going to step out of the way, put the spotlight on the man who deserves it more than I do. I'm going to bring up Ben Carlsrud, president of Network Center, and welcome. <laughs> Mic check. Got me? Perfect. Well, look at this. Let me uh, say thank you all in person and virtually on the internets of things for uh, coming out and hanging out with us today. Quite a difference from uh, 2020 a year ago if you uh, participated. You know, instead of looking at all of you fine folks in, in the circle, it was staring into bright lights, which haven't changed, but a camera. And it's kind of amazing you know, a year a difference can make. You know, so today is, you know, getting together, hanging out. You know, what are our whys kind of. So, you know, we're back, right? Like, this is, this is exciting. This is, you know, what we're, what we're about. So when we talk about Envision, you know, what, what, is, what is our why? why? Why do we do this? And it, it's really, it covers two of our three core values. The first one I'm going to chat about is dedication to customer success. And this is, this is where our commitment to you is, you know, how do we collaborate? How do we come together? What are we bringing forth for to you? And when I was thinking about this, you know, last year it was, it was a little bit harder to, let's say, gauge the response, right? Because there were several of us hanging out in the hallway, but, you know, there, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, what I would call water cool conversations, uh, hallway conversations. So there used to be uh, a little marketing thing that we used to do, and it, it was a little slick, and it was a picture of uh, basically an ethernet cord, a uh, network connection into the wall. And the tagline on that was lasting connections. And when we think about that, you know, it's, it's from Network Center's standpoint, it's you know, our relationships with you for the long term. But when we look at today, you know, last year we didn't really get the opportunity to generate connections, right? The 18 months has been you know, whether you're working from home or maybe you're in the office, but you're social distancing. Today, you know, for the folks in person, 
this is where a lot of the value comes from this type of event. Not to say, hopefully, you folks up in the internets, you know, you get some great content uh, from the, the breakouts and that kind of stuff, but the person you're sitting next to, the, uh, the, when you get done with the, uh, a breakout, and we can go hang out in the hallway, I mean, that's where those connections are generated. And hopefully, you know, as you progress through the day, you know, we kind of get reinvigorated about what this community is, oops, uh, the community, because that's really what this is all about. And, you know, I'm in the quad, and I'm walking in circles. I could do a pirouette, but I'd probably pop a hip, and nobody wants to see that. But, you know, it, this, is, this is super cool. So this is, this is our dedication to you to, you know, continue to move this forward, and I want to thank you so much for coming to hang out with us. The other one is responsible innovation, the other core value, and that, that, that's technology, right? So it's, you know, what are we seeing? What, uh, are you waving at me, Andrew? No, okay, perfect. Um, you know, what are we seeing? What, what do we think we should be, you know, bringing forth? And that, that, that's that portion of it. So there is a lot of really cool breakouts today, a lot of really good content, and hopefully between those two core values, you walk away from the day going, wow, that, that, was, that was good time spent. Um, for the folks up in the internets, you know, do your Q&A. Uh, you're not going to have the opportunity to, you know, hang out with us in the hallway and that kind of stuff. But, you know, please be sure to reach out if there's something that, you know, you saw that motivates you, that, that drew you in, and uh, we, can, we can get something moving forward for you. You know, so I'm going to end with some thank yous. And uh, so first off, you know, all of you, right, but also customers that are, you know, either helping us present, supporting panelists. You know, we can't do this kind of thing without individuals stepping in and helping out. So super appreciate it from that standpoint. Um, all of our vendors, if you look around the room, please, you know, spend some time um, chatting with them. Thank you to all of you, because without you, this is really difficult, right? You help support us by driving good conversations, presentations, being in person and you know, kind of just really getting back to the grit of what this is all about. Um, thank you to the NCI team, because the last 18 months have been, well, we'll just say wonky, right? But the amount of effort that goes into this type of event is kind of staggering. So you know, from the setup, the teardown, you know, all the team members that are doing presentations, Jake taking pictures, and you better get my good side. Um, but you know, when, when you talk about work-life balance and trying to blend all this stuff in, it, it's, it's kind of staggering from that standpoint. And then you know, two special call-outs, uh, Andy, Luann, Luann and Andy, no specific order. I can't see where you're at, but the amount of, oh, right here, uh, the amount of effort that, that these two people put in to make this a totally kick-butt event is, is staggering. The, the coordination, the herding of cats, the I don't know, gnashing of teeth to get people to get their stuff done and in so we know when things are going to happen um, is, is very, well, very much appreciated. So, you know, I'm going to end with that. Uh, hopefully, you know, today is, is you're back to it because maybe this is your first conference back. I know as far as being in a group of people like this, this is my first time back. So this is, this feels good. This feels right. You know, if this is your first event, um, thanks for coming out and hanging out with us and giving us a chance. If it's your 20th event, kick butt. Thanks for hanging out with us for that many years. Uh, I'm going to move on, give it back to Andy, and away we go. All right, thank you, Ben. A uh, couple other quick notes, because I don't remember everything the first time around. Uh, we did, we've mentioned the sponsors and stuff a couple times, vendors. Uh, you'll notice that they are strategically surrounding you. That is not an accident. We want you at some point to have some sort of uncomfortable eye contact. They will draw you in, so please talk to them. Uh, the other thing, for the folks that are on uh, watching in virtually, any of the tracks that are taking place during the sessions taking place in the Great Hall will be available on any of the tracks within there. So if you're business track, uh, technical track, whichever one, um, like the next session, for instance. As long as you're on any one of those, you will see the session. So what I want to do now, oh, sorry, one more. The session this afternoon with IBM is moving to virtual only. It's now with Randy Ars now, I believe. If I butchered, name, butchered your name, Randy, I apologize. So that's going to be the two o'clock session with IBM. It's going to be virtual only. 
as I'm being told. Um, but okay, we're gonna then start to pivot to uh, what I know to be a really cool topic in discussion. Um, I worked with the Peterson Farm Seed team earlier this year. I haven't worked directly with Carl, but we're gonna bring him up here in a minute. Uh, Peterson Farm Seed is a kick butt company, good team. Uh, the project they had uh, that we worked with them on, uh, pretty cool there, but I think the topic of discussion today is gonna be beyond just an application, more than that. So I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna spoil the topic, but I do wanna bring up Carl Peterson, a man who probably doesn't need a ton of introduction. I know that a lot of people know who he is throughout the community, uh, his organization, the things that he does. Um, here I'm gonna, he's proud to say I have never, I have lived in the same house my entire life and I've never had a job. And I think that's a pretty cool thing, so it sounds like he's gonna expand on that. Really, he's got more interesting things to, things to say than I do, so Carl, if you wanna come on up and welcome. Um, before I start, um, I stopped by here last night to just kind of see what the setup is, right? And I went home and I told my wife, Julie, there's like screens everywhere. I'm standing on a little platform in the middle of the thing surrounded by screens with screens on the front and the back. And her immediate reaction was, who's running the tech for all that? And I told her it was our good friends from Livewire. And when I told her that, she said, okay, it'll be good. So I just wanna let you guys know in advance that we very much appreciate what you do and how seamless you make all these things happen. So uh, thank you. Um, about five years ago, I sat down with Mark Angus, our tech director, or however that's titled, and I said, Mark, here's the thing. Our little company is world class at determining which are the best products to place with our customers in their fields across this region. There's nobody that we feel does a better job of that. He said, we're world class at producing and conditioning uh, seed to the highest possible quality standard. He said, Mark, we're a world class at delivering that seed, tracking that through our dealers, making sure they have uh, the service that they need. And I think we're world class at customer service. He said, in order for us to fully reach our potential, however, we have to be world class in our information systems. And, and frankly, at that point, uh, we had a ways to go. We'd made a lot of progress. It wasn't too long before that, where before we conditioned seed, we had to fill out a work order on paper. And there were 56 pieces of information that went on that work order, only five of which were unique and that were drivers. The rest of those were all just stuff that was stored here and there within a couple of different data systems. And the individual had to figure those out had to go dig those all up by hand. It took a tremendous amount of time. And those are just the kind of things that we just can't do in this day and age. And uh, I know that Mark took this to heart. I know that he remembers that conversation. And I can tell you that there's been a tremendous amount of effort and frankly, a lot of money spent um, to elevate those systems. And um, we are now in a really good place because of the efforts of Mark and his team. Um, I, I got on the screen here the last 10 feet. And what I, what I mean by that is so many of our systems uh, have all the data and so on and so forth. If you think about it, it's like building a bridge. If you're gonna try to build a bridge across a 100 foot chasm, um, a lot of times the data systems that we have are wonderful 90, bridges. And that last 10 feet is what as managers and as other people in the company really need that last 10 feet in order to take action. All right, if you want to look at it another way, we all need to make data driven decisions, right? Uh, and most of the time, those decisions based on the data take about 20 seconds, maybe. In fact, 
most of the time, or a lot of the time, those really aren't decisions at all. Those are just lining up the data that you have against parameters that you have already determined to, to take an action. They're not a decision in the sense that we think about strategic things and those kind of, those kind of actions. So it takes 20 minutes to take the decision and gathering the data to actually make that decision can be hours of pain, right? Has anybody else experienced that? I'm seeing some heads, not too many hands. Um, do you got some pretty strong coffee or just like these guys need a, you know, yeah, maybe. Um, and those are the kind of things that we've had, we have to get away from, we just can't do that. Um, so a little bit before I go into the systems that we're using about our company and how we operate. Uh, my wife, Julie, is here, uh, and she and I have been partnered since we began our company. Uh, and one of the things that we've talked about for years is that whatever we're doing, how we gauge how we're doing, we always measure three ways. First off, we measure how are we doing versus our competitors, right? Because that's a, are we a viable business? So we have to know, and generally speaking, we feel pretty good. You know, everybody has advantages and disadvantages, but generally speaking, we feel pretty good about how we're doing versus our competitors. The second way we always want to measure is how are we doing compared to last year? Because that's a measure of, measure of progress. And one of the things that is so important to us culturally as a company and personally is, are we moving forward? Are we better this year than we were, than we were last year? Because if we're not, quite frankly, I'm not too interested in continuing what we're doing. We want to continue to get better every single year. And most of the time, we can say, you know what? We're doing a better job at whatever it is, whatever aspect of our company, than we did last year. But then there's a final measurement. And that's how are we doing compared to the vision of what we think we could be doing? And most often, frankly, when we line up that measurement, we look on how we're doing, and we look at what we think we should be doing, and we kind of go, you know what, we kind of suck. Because there's an awful lot of progress to be made, even when you think you're doing as well as you possibly can do. So that's one of the paradigms of our company and how we try to operate. Another one is that we will not tailor our business practices to software design. Whatever industry you are in, there is likely a, a software company and a very good company who has put together uh, an add-in or a, a product that sits on top of the other product that's designed for your industry. But we have never found one that actually does things exactly the way want, we, we want to do them. And we are not willing to bend our business practices to fit a software design. And I'll tell you, that's pretty challenging. Um, uh, we compete with and do business with a lot of really, really large companies, multinational, multi-billion dollar companies. With, uh, they have more lawyers than people that I know. Um, and oftentimes we find they have ERP installations, frequently they're SAP, that they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on. And frequently those are so rigid that the people within those companies spend about half their time trying to get around the system. A quick story. A few years ago, uh, uh, one of those companies had a piece of research equipment that was not being used at their research station. And it was just sitting in the back of their warehouse gathering dust. It, was, it wasn't a huge thing, you know, it was maybe a $10,000 piece of equipment. And I'm like, I'd like to buy that from you because I can use that even though you're not using it. And the guy running the station said, you know, I'd like to sell it to you. It's in our way. It's gathering dust. But frankly, the scale of what it is and the amount of pain it would take to get that through the SAP system, it's just not worth it. It's probably still sitting in the corner over there. We won't tailor our business practices uh, to software design. Software companies come up with things, and I, I'm not knocking these companies at all, because um, maybe some of you are those companies, but you know, the, the design comes up and says, well, this is how we do sales in the seed industry. Well, maybe I don't want to do sales that way. So, some of it's maybe just arrogance on our part. And the final that I'm going to talk about, we have a lot more, is always be preparing for growth. We want to be a bigger company next year 
than we are today. And the year after that, we want to be bigger still. There's a very famous Harvard Business Review article that talks about a trucking company in the Northeast. And it talks about how they were very good at what they did, and they were growing. And each year they got a little bit bigger, and then they reached a critical point, and all of a sudden, none of their systems worked anymore. You'd think that, you know, as you get a little bit bigger, you'd uncover some glitches and those kind of things. But in my experience is, and it lines up with this article, is that that's not really the way it works in business. Your systems are fine until all of a sudden none of them are, are adequate anymore. So early in our company, when we were undercapitalized and trying to bootstrap, we, were, we had a philosophy of until we absolutely need some capital improvement, we're not going to buy it because we're a little uncertain. And we've changed that, especially with our data systems, that we have to be prepared for that next step. Okay, before I talk about the actual systems that we use, it probably would be helpful to you know a little bit about our business. Um, seems like a lot of stories that I have start with so many years ago, but in this case, about 12 years ago, we hired a new CFO. His name was Jim, great guy, and Jim came in on his first day. I sat him down, I said, Jim, here's the thing, our business is very simple. We license traits and genetics from a lot of large companies we produce corn and soybean seed with growers and contractors and so on and so forth. We package that corn and soybean seed, condition it. We sell it through and to dealers, uh, and then it ends up getting planted by the farmer. Said our business is pretty simple, that's what we do. So Jim went away, uh, and about two weeks later he came down, he walked into my office, sat down very quietly and said, you know, your business is a little more complicated than you think it is. And I wasn't totally surprised by that, honestly, but um, really our business seems fairly simple, but, uh, you know, in order to license traits, we have to negotiate those trade licenses. We have to track all those things. We have to keep track of the pricings and the terms and the limitations and all those kinds of things. Uh, we run the largest testing program in the upper Midwest, independent, for, for yield testing. So we have... Um, about 40,000 individual plots in about 12, 15 locations, both corn and soybeans. We have to collect about 250,000 data points, most of those that need to be organized and transferred back to the owners of those genetics. Uh, when we produce corn and soybean seed for soybeans, uh, we work with more than 100 growers in three states, more than 200 fields, 44 traits, or 44 products, four traits. We have to track each one of those back to the field and the grower, both upstream for our product and downstream uh, to the customer. Um, we have about 100 small plot increases because one of our paradigms as a business is to be useful to the people that we need in order to survive and to, to flourish. So, so we work with some of the very large companies to help them develop products. Uh, we have 44 corn products, hundreds of lots, Six seed sizes, two package types. Uh, the corn business is bizarrely complicated. And we have an annual planting cycle of about 18 months. Now, there's a lot of supply chain things going on now in the industries, and you see this, well, we can't order, can't get chips, we can't get uh, anything like that. Our normal product cycle in February of this year, we will have to sit down and make our first determination of what we want to produce for customers to plant in the spring of 2023. We have about an 18-month planting cycle. Once that seed gets planted um, in the spring, uh, there's very little we can do to increase or decrease the supply. We've made our commitments, uh, and we have no idea what anybody's going to want to plant uh, the next year. Uh, when we package that, this is just an example of a single corn contract. Uh, one corn contract um, in February, next few months, we'll have to make a wild guess about what we're gonna have in the summer, we're gonna be putting that in the field. They're producing bushels. We sell at 80,000 80, kernel units, so we'll have to determine about, you know, what the cleanout's gonna be, what the, and then we have to figure out, you know, what are the seed sizes gonna be based on what's growing in the field. You ever look like at a corn cob and you say, well, it's gonna be 28% large rounds. And we're kind of guessing. And then 
in the fall we get shakeouts, which takes us a little closer, and then in the early winter, in a few months, we'll start to get actual hard quantities. Um, we have to start selling this stuff in September. We don't really know what we have, but we need to try to manage that supply. Uh, and then we can't oversell because if you sell something to a farmer and then you don't have it, he's generally unhappy. Uh, but then we have to be careful not to undersell because the largest business risk for a seed corn company is poor management of inventory. All right, so then we ship and sell that to growers, we have, to dealers, we have to track that inventory in real time. And when the seed arrives to the farmer, he plants it, right? But we want to track customer behavior so we know how we can follow up. And then we have to service any customer issues that might show up. And then finally, we have to report every transaction back to the supplier. So a farmer plants a particular lot of corn seed. We have to be able to track that back, let the supplier know exactly what that was, who he is. And then they all have to sign licenses to grow those products, and we also have to track those. So the challenges are a little more formidable, really, than what even I would have thought they would be, and I've been doing this for 26 years. So here's our environment. We use Business Central for accounting. Uh, we use CRM. Uh, CRM, in a traditional way, is tracking customer interactions and addresses and sales process, all that, and, and we do that. Um, but we probably use it more for a data warehouse and for process automation. Uh, Mark and his team are just amazing at getting those things to work together. Uh, then we have a dealer portal, not particularly unusual. Uh, Power BI has been crucial to bridging that last 10 feet. Now, there's probably most of you in this room know more about the details about Power BI than I do, uh, but the implementation of that is crucial. And then there's something called flow that I really don't know anything about that scrambles everything up and makes everything talk to each other. Uh, aside from that, uh, we also have a Teams implementation, which is pretty common at this point. Uh, we use a product called Fleetio to manage a bunch of trucks on the road. Uh, power apps uh, is something that we've, I think, just scratched the surface of that has tremendous potential uh, for our people that are mobile. Uh, we, we, we are pretty heavy into precision egg, which I'm not going to really talk much about, except uh, I want you to be aware that we may or may not have a secret but deadly predator drone project that we're working on. Just keep that in the front of your mind for later. Um, and then uh, Field Planner, which is the project that we worked with the good folks at Network Center on, but which uh, we think is hugely successful. Um, okay, so I told my kids I was speaking at the tech at a tech conference, and you know they said, um, "Really? Um, you don't really even know how to work your phone." So it's pretty obvious I'm not doing any of this stuff, right? Okay, and I walked around the room and looked at the displays here, and I have I have no idea what any of you people do. So I'm not really the guy that drives any of this stuff. So um, uh, here's our team. Yeah, like you thought at a conference like this, I'm actually going to tell you who these people are. Uh, uh, you know, Ben said at his opening, he's like, well, you know, it's like, oh, the meetings are good, you know, but all the connections in the hallways, like, yeah. Uh, did I mention we may have or may not have a deadly predator drone program in our so if any of you have any ideas of, because I'm actually going to tell you who they are um, in just a second here, because uh, I'm pretty proud of the work that they do. Uh, we're very blessed to have these people on our team. So Mark Angus, who I've referenced before and who's here making sure that most of what I say is remotely accurate. Uh, Mark oversees all of our efforts. Uh, he does the CRM. He does hardware. He's our BC guy. Um, and he's really, really uh, talented at those things. Kirk. Brockman, is, uh, he, he's our Power BI guy. Uh, he led our Teams implementation. He's done our Power Apps uh, things and uh, also was the, the leader on our project uh, that we did here for, for Field Planner. And, and, and Derek, I'm not really sure what Derek does, honestly. I, I know that he's like the flow guy, but frankly, he kind of sits in his workstation staring at his computer 
almost never says anything. He kind of reminds me a little bit of the hacker in a Bond movie, um, except that instead of the you know, world financial system coming to a complete collapse, all of our flows and data connections uh, seem to work a lot better, and I know that he does a, a great job at that. Okay, so I just appreciate this team. They do a great job. Don't even think about talking to them. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is, our, this is essentially our EIP, right? And uh, I just want to talk just briefly about what we do with each of these, because I think some of the things that we do, you guys would be going like, yeah, everybody does that. And some of them are, I think are kind of unique. All right, so Business Central, all right, Business Central is accounting, right? Accounting is boring. They're just adding up stuff and keeping all the numbers. So, I, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot to say about accounting other than, you know, we do have an implementation. One of the things that is a challenge for us is that all of our packages are different sizes and weights, and all of our orders to our dealers are, you know, just kind of whatever they decide they want. So there's, we're not like shipping a whole truckload of something to anybody. So, and then some of our product is in our warehouse. Some of it is in a bin in Wisconsin. Some of it's been QA'd, some of it hasn't been. So it's have been a really challenging uh, project for our logistics people to put those trucks together in an orderly fashion. And, and we have a, a BI uh, customization that Mark led with uh, a vendor, of, I'm not even sure who, uh, that makes that much more streamlined. Um, one of the things that when I talk about we won't tailor our business practices, uh, sometimes takes us down these roads of customizations that make things much, much better. And our team is using, oh, uh, this is just an example of the, one of the checks. Uh, if somebody tries to ship something that is not really met quality standards. Um, our team in the warehouse is using scan guns in order to make sure that uh, to streamline things. That's really been a big help. Um, I don't think they play video games on them, but I'm not actually sure. Uh, but I know that they allows them uh, to uh, re reduces a lot of entries, reduces a lot of errors. All right, CRM is probably our workhorse in our functioning businesses, and, and we've probably had CRM for 12 years, maybe 15 years, um, and it's evolved from you know kind of a bare bones installation to something that we really use intensively. Some of you probably have been involved in these discussions, like we're gonna. In we're gonna install CRM, we got Microsoft Dynamics coming. We don't know anything about the product. The company that's gonna do the implementation doesn't know much about our business, so you sit down across the table and they go, well, what do you want this to do for you? And our response was, well, we have no idea what it can do for us, other than you know your basic CRM type functions. And frankly, this is not a knock on the people that did that implementation at all. But it was a struggle to get from, you know, some things that were pretty useful and some things that were a little weird with our business to where we are today. It's taken a lot of effort. And we do use it for tracking uh, customer interactions. Uh, we periodically have flogging sessions with our sales team to get them to make the CRM uh, entries that we want them to make because uh, everybody knows how much salespeople love to put things into CRM. But uh, still, our, our probably our most intensive use is as process automation and um, and data warehousing, and, and it's been a very successful product for us. And I've got some screenshots of stuff that aren't really intended for you to like view. They're more or less just kind of an example. So uh, this is just an example of some of the stuff we have at inventory. It's not just how much do we have in the warehouse. How much have we sold? that we have committed that lot. Because when, when we sell a, a bag of corn to a customer, that gets assigned to a lot. So you can't really go out in the warehouse, count how many bags there are, and know how many you have available. Because some of those might have been committed. And it's pretty challenging for us to, to, to do that. Um, again, this is, uh, uh, this is part of our supply management. Supply management, uh, you can nod, is probably the most difficult piece that we have to manage. Because our supplies are uncertain, we don't really know what we have. Uh, orders are coming in, uh, and uh, the process automation that we have to monitor that through CRM has been extremely helpful and extremely effective 
And I don't know how we would honestly run our business without that at this point. Um, one of the things that I talk about when I talked about, you know, you got to gather that information for, for um, hours of pain to make a quick decision. And a lot of those aren't decisions. One of the most effective things for me personally is that when we, we get multiple quality measures on all of our corn, all of our seed lots, and you know, so you have to look at those and go, well, is this, does this meet specs? 95% of them meet specs. With process automation, those come in through an API. 95% of them, they go right through. You never have to look at them. And I only have to look at the ones that maybe are questioned. So that is extremely helpful. Um, and again, this is part of our, we also use that for scheduling uh, our supply uh, management section of that. All right, dealer portal, um, I think that's a fairly common, uh, common thing. Um, this is just how we interact with our dealers. They're able to put entries, orders in there. They're able to look at um, what they currently have. They're able to get documents and so on and so forth. Um, but we also have a, a pretty complex rewards system that is entered through that and aut process automation and CRM. So if you buy, anybody here need any corn seed, by the way? <laughs> if you buy a certain level of, of seed, corn and soybeans, and you commit to that by December 15th, you can pick out some, some pretty cool stuff, right? So these are the low level uh, one point deals. If you make a serious commitment, um, you know, you can get up to three, like a three year commitment, you can get a lease on a Ford, Ford pickup. So, you know, again, if you guys need any seed, uh, come see us afterwards. Um, but this is also a pretty complex uh, project. It includes financing with multiple banks and the dealers are able to enter that information here. It flows into our CRM system where the processes are automated in order to uh, make that really workable at all. Um, and then there's flow, um, oops, sorry. Then there's flow and like I said, I don't really know what that does other than that this is, you guys, there's probably a lot of you that know way more about this than I do, but we used to use something called Scribe and occasionally it would seem like it would hiccup. At least that would be the story I would get when something didn't work, that scribe hiccup there. Flow seems to be a lot more uh, stable. Power BI is probably the biggest single um, tool that we use to bridge that last 10 feet. Because all of these other systems we have, those are really part of that 90 foot bridge across that 100 foot chasm but to get useful information, timely and live to salespeople, management people, uh, Power BI has been uh, hugely important. And one of the things that, y'all probably know this, but um, took me a while to figure out that the key to that, or the keys to that is not only that it's a great product, it seems to be pretty flexible and easy to use, but you have to make sure that the managers and salespeople who are gonna interact with that spend sufficient time to define what they really want. Because I know over the years with various reporting systems, we have spent a lot of time getting reports ready for people and you get it in front of the person and they go, eh, that's not really exactly what I was looking for. And so that seems to be the key. Uh, and Kirk on our team, uh, or Dirk, I think I was gonna, we'll call him Dirk, um, uh, is pretty much a whiz with that. So this is a, just an example of a, of a product, or a, a thing that we use to help us with how we're gonna condition corn and what sizes, because you have to decide uh, which sizes you're gonna to put together. And you've got some graphics and some nice looking things on the side, and then some sliders at the top so that the, you, you know, those of us that are a little less tech savvy can interact with this uh, without too much difficulty. Kirk told me don't put this one up on the screen because it's boring. Uh, and, and really, I get that, it doesn't look like much, but this little report that I don't know how long it took Kirk to make, uh, I, is exciting to me because this is putting together information from various parts of our system and this page probably saved me the better part of a full work week over the course of the last winter uh, as opposed to trying to drag all that information. So yeah, it looks boring, but it's actually pretty exciting. Uh, this is one that we use for assignments where we have a uh, lot of information, sales information, and then for the sales guys, we've kind of got red and light, red and green and you know, so that it doesn't get too complicated. Uh, uh, this is again, 
a report for the sales team, and there's all kinds of tabs and all kinds of information. And the beauty of these things is that if they don't have exactly what they want, our Kirk can get that very quickly. As I understand, this is just creates a very large data set that he can access. And then uh, this is a show parts of our dealers. The colors indicate which territory manager services that dealer, the size of the dot is, you know, how big that dealership is relatively to, uh, and uh, you can do a lot of things with maps and that as well. Uh, this is just something that our truckers use so they can see what truck is going where and what's going to be taking so that it helps plan out that uh, very effectively. And then this one's for management. So you see there's lots of colors here and little graph things, right? Because, you know, managers like to see, they talk about dashboards. Um, and so this kind of meets that need and, and we can tweak those things. Uh, but also lots of very, very useful information there. Uh, that's the core of our system. Yeah, okay, so probably most of you people have been using Teams. We were very fortunate at that our Teams uh, installation had started a little before the pandemic hit. So uh, we were just about ready live when it happened. So that was very helpful to us. Uh, and we have changed, uh, we've ma made Teams our primary conduit to communicate uh, with our team. So once a week, there's something that comes out to everybody. It's called the Peterson Post. Uh, and uh, that has a lot of information. Julie is in, in charge of the Peterson Post. And um, you don't want to be that person who asks a question in a group. It's like, what about this? If it was in the Peterson Post that week. Because you will get immediately your finger slapped to say, that was in the post. Uh, so, you know, and we have a lot of fun with that, but uh, frankly, uh, that's not an accident. It's a very intentional thing to make sure that that drives people to the team site for their company communication. Because otherwise, you know, people get lackadaisical. They don't necessarily go there and, and look at those things. One thing I would say about teams, uh, that it seems that their file management system is, and their teams is maybe better suited to companies that are more siloed than we are, because we have a production team and a sales team. We tend to have a lot of teams where, you know, we have people from all over, and then it can get a little confusing uh, sometimes on what those things are. Um, we use a product called Fleetio. That's what our guys use to put their mileage and stuff into their, into their trucks. I very carefully not learned much about that because um, they don't make me use it yet and if I know how to use it they probably will but uh, I know that that saved our accounting team tons of time and I think that integrates with BC in some fashion to uh, go with that um, and then power apps uh, so um, I was just sort of like vaguely aware of this until Kirk on our team came with some amazing things to me that our teams can use so our teams go out to the field and they're taking notes on the field and we want to track that, associate that with an account. If we can, you know, geo-reference that to where that field is, uh, that's, that's a big plus, makes it much easier. Our soybean production team needs to go out and inspect those fields. And so, you know, what that has entailed over the years is you're walking out in the wind with a clipboard and a bunch of papers and a pencil and you're trying to put all that stuff into the paper and then you have to transfer and it was really a pain, uh, really difficult. And maybe you got assigned a field and you didn't really even know where this field was and it was challenging to find it. So with Power Apps, um, that, that basically is the home screen for that part of that. Uh, and we can do scouting, uh, production, they can add a field right from there. And if they want to find a field, they can click on that and that app will take them to their um, mapping software on their phone and show them exactly line by line directions. So, okay, I know a lot of that stuff is kind of common now, but in our industry, that's, that's pretty unique. That's pretty unique. Uh, you can see uh, they show pictures of the fields. You can add scouting, add production, edit a field. You can get directions to the field. Uh, and that is, uh, that's crucial. Uh, I think, and I think we've just scratched the surface. I think there's a lot of uh, things that will be available that we can set up in, in Power Apps in order to uh, integrate with our systems better screenshots. 
precision thing I'm not going to talk about, except for it is like this monstrous hole that large companies, small companies, venture capital companies have been dumping money into for years, trying to find the magic bullet app for precision egg. Uh, egg is a very tech focused business. Most of the time when you see uh, computers and or, or co tractors and combines, there's at least one or two computers in that machine doing certain things. Uh, I can, when I have a, uh, somebody combining corn out in my field, I can pull that up on my iPad and I can see the combine in the field. I can see the yields. I can see all those kind of things. Nobody's figured out how to all tie all that together. And the problem has typically been that in order to be useful, the products are too complicated to use. And so that is, uh, there's going to be some major innovations happening there. We are making a lot of efforts behind the scenes to make sure that we're not left behind because that's going to be a, a key. But that does leave, uh, lead us to the last thing I want to talk about, uh, which is Field Planner. And that's the project that we did here with Network Center over the course of the years. We have wanted for a long time to have a sales tool that our team could use, that they could go out into the field, they could make a planting plan with their farmer using some of the precision ag or at least some of the geo-reference maps and so on and so forth uh, and come up with a professional looking presentation that they could give to that customer uh, because we know that that will help us increase seals, uh, sales. We know that that will help our relationship with those customers and, and help us grow our company. And we spent a, a fair amount of money chasing rabbit holes and finding things that people had it here as a product that can probably do that. Uh, none of them really met our needs. And so uh, finally, we just sort of said, what if we tried to make our own? Uh, and, and again, I, was, I don't know the first anybody to do that. So it's like, can we actually do that? And, and we partnered with the good folks at Network Center to, to make that happen. So we have a short little video that talks about how that goes. <laughs> So we're currently kind of in beta. We haven't released this to the entire team, but we do have a number of our salespeople using it, using it very successfully. The customers love it. Uh, our sales team uh, really likes it. And uh, let's see, what have I got on the screen here? I've got, I've got all I see is me. I'm not that excited. Um, there we go. So there are two parts to this. One is making a customer plan where our people can work with their existing customers to very quickly and easily make a detailed planting plan, product plan uh, for those customers in a very professional looking uh, manner. Uh, th and the other is prospecting by field. Uh, and this is pretty unique. Um, you can go out on, a, on this program and go to that mapping section and you can float around pretty much anywhere you want and you can click on a field, and what you will see then is these color codes like that has, and a listing of who are the operators of those fields. And when you, and this is third party data, when you click on one of those operators, it will show you essentially all of the fields that they farm. It's not perfect, but it's probably about 90 to 95% accurate. So if our sales team is looking and they see a field and they're wondering, I wonder who farms that, who is the cus potential customer that has that field, they can very quickly find out a lot of information about who that person is, how much they farm, where else they farm. Uh, the system goes through a past cropping history and gives you a predictive uh, crop rotation. So what crop that the ro normal rotation would have that farmer putting on that field each year. 
Now, that's not something you want to show up in the farmer's yard and go, hey, I see here's all the field you farm, uh, you know, and because that's a little creepy, honestly. Um, but it does give them some perspective. Uh, the other is to go with their existing customers and say, okay, so these are the products that we had on your fields last year. They can very quickly, so one of our salespeople, one of the customers that they sell most or all of their seed to, in about 20 minutes, they can make a plan of which products that our salesperson feels could, would be best suited for that field um, based on historical pop, planting populations about what they're going to need. And so that when they go to see that customer, they can look at that farmer's operation field by field and um, have a very professional looking presentation of what our product, what our, our best fit for that is. That is pretty different from the way seed has historically been sold. Seed has historically been a very product driven industry. So the typical response or the typical way that we approach seed is to go, I have this new uh, 90 day corn hybrid that's really done well in plots here and there. Uh, you should buy some of this product. And, and we're not serving our, our, our customers the best that we can if that's how we approach it. Uh, that, was, that was the impetus for our first CRM in, uh, uh, installation uh, 12, 15 years ago, and it remains a driver for us today. Still, most of our competitors use a product-driven approach, and we think that in order to change the game, we need to get to a customer-driven approach, uh, and this is, a, uh, this is a big part of that. Um, you, can, you can see the field there. Uh, if you can tell, you can, you can draw in a field, you can change a field boundary. If somebody builds a house in the middle of a field, you can, you can excise that part out. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it's just worked uh, very, very well. Uh, again, there's two parts to that. And again, we give plaudits to our friends at Network Center who, where's the guy in the shorts? He was there. There he is. Awesome. It came in on time. But I do have a little bone to pick with you. You're over budget. So it's a great product. Came in on time. But you realize you were $541 over budget. <laughs> so I'm going to say that's on time, great product, and basically on budget. Right, so I'm not blaming you. I'm gonna take I take that out on Mark, anyway. Park, yeah, right. Um, but again, as with reports, the key to the success of that project was threefold. First of all, having a clear understanding of what we really wanted. Second of all, having enough preparation on our side so that when we presented what we wanted to the folks at Network Center that we could, it was clear with screenshots and pictures and the whole nine yards. And then the third, of course, is to work with great people who understand the technology and can make that happen. Um, so that's basically uh, what I wanted to talk about.